it is generally assumed that early in the solar system and close to the sun, almost all of the material, or even all of the material, in the protoplanetary disk was completely evaporated and in a gas phase. Now this then started to cool down, and minerals solids began to condense from this gas phase. And the sequence in which these minerals condensed is shown in this diagram here. Now there are two ways how the material can condense. The first is that the condensing minerals at each temperature step completely react with the surrounding gas. So they are always in equilibrium with the surrounding gas, which means that some minerals that form early are disappearing during this sequence as the, these react to new minerals. This is called equilibrium condensation. Now the second way is that the condensing material did not completely react with the surrounding gas, but only part of the solids reacted with the surrounding gas. And this is then called fractional condensation. And this is what is shown here on this um, diagram. On the y-axis, there is the temperature decreasing from top to bottom. And on the x-axis axis here, there is the isolation degree. And this indicates the amount of material that is not reacting at each temperature step with the surrounding gas. And this is a log scale uh, and increasing here. Now let's start with um, a small isolation degree down here. Um, this small isolation degree basically equals to an equilibrium condensation. So this is what we observe here is basically an equilibrium condensation. Now the first minerals to condense are rich in refractory elements, something like calcium and aluminum, so corundum, hipponite, metallite, spinel, and so on. So this material find and also in calcium aluminum rich inclusions, so CAIs, but also of course in chondrules. But um, the amount of these minerals is comparatively small, as the elements, calcium aluminum refractories, have about an order of magnitude lower abundance as magnesium, silicon, and iron. So after this condensed, then the main elements and the corresponding minerals start to condense. And these are um, phosphorite, so this is this line here, so phosphorite is at, at a higher temperature, um, diopside, ansatides, so the pyroxenes, and then there are also lines for anatide and metallite, which are shown more, more, more to this side, but the lines are up here. So all these main minerals condense in a comparatively small um, temperature interval. So diopside, olivine, ansatide, and then the feldspars. And quite some temperature below is, is troilite, so sulfur-rich um, mineral. Then this is a different spinel than this one. So one is aluminum-rich, the other is more magnesium-rich. And down here are then um, water-rich phases or OH-rich phases. And as I said, this is essentially then here the equilibrium condensation sequence. Now let's go to higher isolation degrees. And the interesting changes start at around something like 0.2% uh, up to maybe something like 2 or 3%. So this is the interval in which the interesting changes take place. Now the maybe most important change here is the occurrence of silica, so SiO2. And this is in particular important because this is something that we directly observe in meteorites. When we look at chondrules, these are often mineralogically sown. So they have olivine in the core, surrounded by pyroxene, and in rare cases, even some silica. So this is a very directly shows the condensation sequence and the fractional condensation sequence. But there's also chondrules that have silica in them, as silica, together with pyroxene, no olivine. Um, and these also must have formed from fractional condensation, and then they are maybe remolten or something like this. So we see direct evidence for this kind of fractional condensation. And it's then very good to see that this is also, that this can also be reproduced in this model here. And we can also use this to quantify the isolation degree for silica, which is something like maybe 0 0.5, 0 0.4, something like that. It doesn't matter, it's just about the, the, the range. It's not 0 0.005 or 
10, it's about half a percent isolation degree here. And because this, this is quite an important um, process, I want to illustrate a little how this works. And how this works is as follows. So the solids that form our first olivine with a magnesium silicon ratio, so I'm, I'm neglecting the iron here, this would just make this all more, more, um, would fraction is even more, in fact. So this magnesium silicon ratio here of two. Then anzatite forms with a magnesium silicon ratio of one. Now the solar value, atomic ratio is about 1.05 magnesium silicon. Which means that when we remove the olivine with a lot of magnesium in it, um, so the magnesium is removed from the nebula, from the gas, and then the gas increases in silicon. And when then anzatite is condensing and it takes away magnesium silicon in the same proportions, the gas remains high in silicon and given that the olivine does not react or at least not completely react to um, pyroxene. But this is what we observe in meteorites. There's lots of olivine um, um, still there. So this is decreasing temperature here so that after olivine anzatite condensed, the gas is still high in silicon, which means silica can condense. And this is basically um, the simple. This is basically the simple mechanism behind the occurrence of SiO2 here. Then other minerals such as ultramite start to appear, which is found in anzite chondrites, for example. Um, but the, the important bit that we learned from this is that, um, first of all, condensation very likely happened in the early solar system, and the process of condensation was fraction condensation, and here we can even quantify how much isolation must have happened in the early solar system.